Thank you very much and good afternoon. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, I'm intending to be about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then hopefully we can open it into uh, discussion. Uh, let me start with this. Jimmy Savile died um, in the autumn of uh, 2011 as a very popular uh, figure. Um, within the next 12 months, um, lots and lots of rumours started to circulate about uh, what he may have been up to during his lifetime. And it was in the autumn of 2012 that the Metropolitan Police therefore set up Operation Utri because there were so many allegations about Jimmy Savile swirling around um, that needed to be looked at. And the mood of disquiet was such that even though Jimmy Savile was obviously dead, it was decided that there would be a team, the Utri team, that would look into the allegations. And um, anybody who wanted to speak to that team was invited to come forward. That team was set up in October 2012, and it published its report in January 2013, so just three, three and a half months later. During that time, the U Tree team of police officers saw 600 individuals who claimed that Jimmy Savile had abused them. Um, 224 of those, the police um, said, were recordable crimes. In other words, had that information on its own been available during Jimmy Savile's lifetime, um, they would have investigated it as a recordable crime. How many of those 224 do you think came forward during Jimmy Savile's life? About Four. So 220 of the 224, and that's probably not all of the um, victims, um, said absolutely nothing to anybody about what Jimmy Savile had done to them. Um, and they were asked by the U Tree team of officers who had the NSPCC working with them why they hadn't come forward. And they said, I didn't think I'd be believed. And they said, I didn't think the criminal justice system could cope with me. I didn't have enough faith in the criminal justice system to even come forward um, and report it to anyone. That's a really serious state of affairs for anybody involved in delivering justice. The vast majority of those victims simply didn't think our criminal justice system could cope with them. A real access to justice issue. Four, the four that did come forward, three came forward to Surrey Police and one came forward to Sussex Police. Their cases didn't proceed because in the end, no one of those victims wanted their case to go forward. There were two features about that that were interesting. First, no one victim was told there was another one out there. The police in the late 1990s had been accused of trawling for victims, telling one victim there was another victim out there. And there'd been scathing reports in Parliament. And they had understood that to mean you could never tell one victim there was another victim who had made an allegation let alone the details. So each of the four never knew there were three others. And on their own, they said, I don't stand a chance against a celebrity like him. I can't take him on on my own. And the police um, really influenced and persuaded them to that, with good intention. They thought that it would be unfair on the victim to try and take on Jimmy Savile as a one-on-one -on -one. Uh, with the victim. So they were saying, you know, are you sure you want to take on Jimmy Savile? He's going to have really big gun lawyers, and it's just little old you. And each of them said, no thanks. Years later, uh, when my principal legal advisor, Alison Levitt, went to see each of the four victims, they each said, had they known there were others out there who would have, as it were, together uh, brought the case, they would in all likelihood have uh, taken the case forward. Um, and that business of not taking on a celebrity resonates for us with a lot of recent cases since the Operation Utri team was set up. There have been a number of arrests, a number of prosecutions of um, high-profile individuals. Dave Lee Travis, um, who's due to be retried on two of the charges uh, in the near future. Uh, Nigel Evans, of course, was acquitted three weeks ago. And Max Clifford, 
um, was convicted two days ago. But there was a perception before the Max Clifford verdict that we were back in the same territory, that um, if you were up against a high-profile individual or a celebrity, the chances um, of succeeding um, were greatly lower than they would otherwise be. So um, it, what the Jimmy Savile case told um, those of us working in criminal justice in England and Wales was the, the vast majority of victims of Jimmy Savile didn't have sufficient confidence in our criminal justice system to come forward. Is that atypical? Is that a Jimmy Savile factor not found elsewhere? Is that something of the past? Well, I don't think so. And um, whilst I was director of public prosecutions, we focused a great deal on violence against women and girls and had um, quarterly numbers and annual numbers. And the, the numbers are, are stark. In England and Wales, um, there are about over a million people who are subjected to domestic violence year on year. Um, but um, only about one in ten of those ever comes forward. And on average, most victims suffer 35 incidents of domestic abuse before they come forward. Uh, the ratio for serious sexual assault, including rape, is one in ten coming forward. So there's a vast mismatch between um, the incidence of um, sexual and personal violence and the likelihood of people coming um, forward. And so that issue as to whether people have confidence to come forward is a real issue that I think is there and has to be confronted. And if this was any other area of law or life, those figures would disturb everybody. We'd all see it as a fundamental access to justice issue. If most people who were entitled to housing benefit didn't claim it, only less than 10% did, we'd say there's something wrong with the system. In the provision of any service, if under 10% came forward, you'd say, you got your system set wrong. People don't feel they can come forward. But in criminal justice, we've never seen it properly as an access to justice issue. So then, what happens if people do come forward? Um, so far as England and Wales is concerned, so far the information provision has been patchy. Sometimes people are told what's going on in their case, but not always, and they're very often not kept up to date. Sometimes there's consultation on decisions and information about decisions, but again, it's patchy. There's a limited right of re review. What do you do if you're a victim? You've come forward, you've cooperated with the police investigation, and the net result is that the prosecutor says, we're not going to bring a case. What can you do? In England and Wales last year, we introduced... Uh, what we call the victim's right of review, which is the right to ask for the decision to be looked at again. But that only applies to the prosecutor's decision. It doesn't apply to the police decision. Counselling um, in our system is not uniform. It's a very big issue. If you have just come forward and reported rape, let's say, um, that... Um, can have a profound effect on an individual. And very often, people are in a real state. And they'll want to know whether they can have any counselling or support. And the standard list of options in England and Wales is, usually, in this order, you're probably better off, better off not doing it. Next option, well, if you do have counselling, try and stay off this topic. Because the victim looks pretty bemused. This is the one thing that's been keeping me awake uh, for the last few um, weeks and months, if not longer. Or, third option, have counselling. You can talk about this abuse, but you need to know that you know the guy you just said did it. We may have to give all your notes to him. And the chin of the people that we've had those conversations with, as they're, as they're given those are their three options, gets closer and closer to the ground as they realise there is no private space for you to have any support or backup. Now you've come forward and made an allegation. And um, as you may know, in the last 12 months in England and Wales, we've had um, some high-profile suicides. A woman called Frances Andrade um, in Manchester committed suicide at the end of her cross-examination in a um, rape case. 
uh, involving a music school in Manchester. And then earlier this year, uh, Tracy Shelvely, um, who um, brought an allegation of rape, um, saw the jury reject that, uh, climbed onto the roof of a shopping centre in, Roch in, in, in Rochdale um, and killed herself. Um, and the resounding message from most of the people who've come forward and been through our criminal justice system is, I'd never do it again, and I'll tell my family and friends never to do it. Um, and that was very stark for us in the child sexual exploitation cases. We had, as you probably saw, a number of cases involving groups of men abusing girls. Um, the biggest case was in Rochdale, and then there have been subsequent trials all over um, England and Wales. And because of the gang nature of that and the way the indictments had to be split up, we quite often required the victim to give evidence in more than one trial. Um, and they uniformly told us exactly what we could do after trial one, and we never got one of them ever to return to court. And they said, I don't care whether the perpetrator gets off. I don't care if I'm letting everybody else down. I'm never going back. So um, we, we've got a pretty profound situation. Most vulnerable victims don't come forward. If they do come forward, uh, they said never do it again. And that's the message that they're sending um, to anybody that will listen to them. So um, what is to be done? Now, um, I know both here and in England and Wales, um, at least in the last 15 years or so, a number of steps have been taken to deal with um, the so-called rights of um, victims. So we introduced special measures in 1999, which allows protection um, for victims and witnesses in court by way of screens, video links, um, voice distortion, um, and other measures, and anonymity. So there are special measures available. We have what we call witness care units, which are joint police and prosecutor units, which are charged with providing information to uh, victims and witnesses about where their cases got to. Um, we had introduced 10 years ago, for the first time, something we called direct communication with victims. Until 10 years ago, prosecutors were pretty well forbidden from ever really talking to a victim or witness. It was thought to be contrary to the adversarial pr um, principle. Ten years ago, we changed that to some extent, so now a prosecutor will actually speak to a victim. Before that, that never happened. But the culture is so deep that actually getting prosecutors to speak to victims is uh, quite a difficult um, thing to achieve. Last year, we had the latest version of our victims' code. That's good. It's got lots of entitlements in it, but it's not legally enforceable. Um, and therefore, um, on the list of priorities for police and prosecutors, it's there, but it's not as high as something which is legally enforceable. There's no sanction if it's breached. And of course, we have the EU directive uh, coming in, as you do, uh, later, I think, next year. So um, here we are. I think if you trace the adversarial system in England and Wales, you can trace it back about 200 years. It's always been seen as a straight fight between the prosecution and the defence. And it was so skewed in favour of the prosecution to start with that the defendant had to fight for his or her rights. So when the adversarial system in England and Wales was set up, um, there was a rule um, that a defendant couldn't be represented and wouldn't be allowed to give evidence. And that was to save the defendant from perjuring himself. So it was thought safer and better and more appropriate um, if they were neither represented nor given the opportunity to commit an offence by going on, on oath uh, before the court. They, they, they would be saved from that. Um, and so, inevitably, um, there was a great focus on defence rights, and defence rights had to be won one by one, and people hold them really dearly to heart, and understandably so. Culminating, I think, in England and Wales, really, with the, uh, our Police and Criminal Evidence Act, in 1984, which dealt with the way suspects are dealt with in custody and required proper recording um, of um, everything that was said between police and, um, uh, and suspect. But in all that period, 
during that, most of that 200 years, the words victims' rights were not even said. There wasn't a big debate about where the proper balance was between prosecutor, victim, and defendant, and we came up with the uh, arrangements that we got. It, there was no mention of victims' rights. In England and Wales, and I don't know what the position is here, I've tried to trace the first ever victims' group, and I managed, I've, I've, gone back, I've found a little group of individuals in Bristol who met in 1979, um, and thought it wasn't good enough for victims. But that's the first group I can find that ever started saying anything about victims' rights. And it took another 20 years before that ever became an established group of NGOs or um, others who found a real voice. So it's only in the last 15 years of our 200-year history that we've really been discussing victims' rights. And if the state of players, as I've described it, we haven't really got very far, and we certainly haven't got far enough. So the question then is, what do we do about it? One of the conclusions I drew at the end of my five-year term as DPP was that we needed something sharper and with a harder edge than a code. We needed a victim's law. And as you may have seen, um, the Labour Party um, uh, in um, England and Wales has committed to a victim's law if elected um, in the elections next year. So um, they are lining up conference pledge last year to um, pass a victim's law. That's quite interesting, just pausing there. We've been saying for years now, 15 years, that victims are at the heart of our criminal justice system. But there's never ever been anything called a victim's law. There's been lots of legislation telling you what the prosecutor can do. Lots of legislation telling you what the defence rights are. There's never been anything that's actually even had the label victims' law. So this will be a first. My feeling is that if the Labour Party do put it in their manifesto, it is then highly likely that the other uh, political parties will follow suit and either commit to a victims' law or at the very least say they'll consider it because it's... Um, politically difficult to argue that the one thing you're not going to do is introduce a victim's law. So for the first time, um, for us, there is now a real prospect that in our next parliament there will be passed a victim's law, a law that um, gives victims rights which are legally enforceable in some shape or form. Now what the Labour Party have done in order to give some shape to that is ask a number of individuals to advise them on what ought to be in the victims' law. Um, and they've called that their victims' task force, and that's the task force that I'm on, along with Doreen Lawrence, who um, needs no introduction here, and Peter Neroyd, who's a retired um, chief constable um, and now an academic at uh, Cambridge. And our job is to advise the Labour Party what they ought to put into their victims' law. They um, decided they'd have a victims' law, but they hadn't got as far as working out exactly what will be in it, um, and so our job is to advise them on what's going to go into it. Um, and also to make wider recommendations about uh, how the criminal justice system could be improved for victims. And we have until October to report back on that uh, project. Um, and I thought I would share with you what we think we should cover um, so that you know what we're doing, but also so that we can then take this into a debate about how these issues are dealt with um, for you. The first is bridging people in, dealing with the confidence issue. Um, most victims of personal and sexual violence are very uncomfortable about reporting to a police station. And I'm going to try something on you here, a bit of audience participation, I hope you don't mind. In your mind's eye, just remember what was your best ever sexual experience. Let's keep poker face <laughs> <laughs> Got it? Now turn to the person to your left and tell them what it was. <laughs> Now, most, 
most of our, I, this was done with a group of 200 prosecutors of mine who are specialist um, rape prosecutors, and there was absolute silence in the room. Because they, they prosecuted, they were specialist prosecutors because they thought there was going to be follow through. And that, that look of horror on their face, <laughs> and relief when they realised that um, it was simply to demonstrate a point. But most of us would find it really, really difficult to talk about our best ever sexual experience. Imagine the worst ever and having to tell a series of strangers and then having to give that evidence in open court and having it tested. It just gives you a sense, having gone through that exercise, of just how difficult it is. So the first question is, how do you bridge people in? And our, we want to explore whether we can't, for personal and sexual violence, get away from the idea that you go to a police station. Um, and um, in um, various places in England and Wales, we've got sexual assault referral clinics. Um, there's a very good one in Manchester, um, uh, which uh, if any of you are over, I would recommend going to see. That is a centre where you can go and report sexual offending. It's in the hospital. Um, and it's staffed by um, clinical experts and health experts. There are police officers there, but they're not the front line. They are expert in knowing what evidence needs to be taken. But it is a wholly different experience to going to a police station. It is akin to going to hospital. It doesn't make it perfect. It doesn't make it easy. But it is fundamentally different to going to a police station. So the first question we've put on the table to consider is, um, is there some way of changing the bridging in exercise? It's the same, uh, perhaps even worse, for children. Most children will not go to, as it were, the statutory authorities if they've been abused. They will very often, um, if they're going to say anything, say things to third-party um, organisations and need to be bridged in from there. And if we don't bridge in, then we're never going to deal, I don't think, with the um, less than 10% that ever come forward in um, the most serious cases. We're going to look at mandatory reporting. This is um, a hot topic in England and Wales at the moment. Should there be a rule um, in relation to those that have authority over children that if they um, reasonably believe that there has been abuse or may be abuse, that they should report it? Because we've seen example after example of schools and other institutions who've had just that belief and decided that the reputation of the school or other institution would be so badly damaged by telling the relevant authorities that it's better to move said teacher or whoever it is to a different school. And the inevitable then um, happened. Now, that's not easy because, as you can imagine, teachers and others are not keen on a mandatory reporting regime. It makes life difficult for them. Um, but we are, we've got on the table, therefore, whether there should be mandatory reporting, and if so, how that regime should work. Um, and it's interesting because the NSPCC, who were against mandatory reporting, uh, are now, I think, probably likely to change their mind and um, say they're in favour. The third thing we want to look at is the support and information that's provided to victims. This is classic victims' rights stuff, a right to have certain information about where your case has got to, um, and um, a sanction if you're not told what you should be told at the right time and some real clarity about counselling, whether one can ever get to the heart of the difficult counselling issue. One thing I'm clear about is that um, counsellors ought to be kite-marked. If you've got counsellors who know what they're doing and have an understanding with the prosecutors and with the court, it is possible to give a reasonable service to victims. If you've got counsellors who don't, um, it all falls apart. But there's no rule in England and Wales that you have to be kite-marked uh, to be a counsellor that you have to prove that you understand the way the criminal justice system works and that you can give the appropriate counselling, um, which uh, supports the individual victim, but without um, making the situation worse for them. Uh, we're going to fourthly look at the review of decisions. I've described to you the prosecutor's, at the moment, voluntary scheme, whereby a decision not to prosecute can be reviewed. Um, the question we're looking at is whether that ought to be a statutory right, whoever takes the decision not to proceed with the case whether it's police or prosecutors. Um, we want to look at the court process. Um, there have been some spectacular examples um, 
in the last 12 to 18 months in England and Wales of very aggressive and repetitive cross-examination of young and vulnerable victims. Um, the worst were the child sexual exploitation gang cases where not infrequently you had 10 to 12 defendants in the dock. You therefore had 10 to 12 barristers representing them. Um, and in some cases, the girls who were victims were cross-examined um, by each of the 12 in turn Four days. The longest, I think, was 56 days. Um, and um, a lot of the judiciary were shocked by that. And there's been a recognition that that just cannot go on. At the moment, all we have are what we call ground rules hearing. It is possible for a judge to have a ground rules hearing a month or so before a trial and say, in this trial, there will only be one counsel asking on each of the issues and I'm going to time limit that counsel in relation to how they deal with it, and you'll have to carve it up amongst yourself. But there's no rule about ground rules hearings. It's up to the judge whether to have one. Um, and there's no um, procedure uh, that has at the hard edge of a right. And then finally, we want to look at um, support for victims after court. Lots of victims and their representatives have said to us, it is really difficult to take into account what's happened at court because it's such an emotional day. And it's particularly bad if the individual is acquitted um, because victims feel that they've had a degree of support up until the hearing. There's then an acquittal. They're told something by the team, if anything, on the day that they can't take in, and that's it. Um, and so we want to look at what should happen in the event of a, an acquittal. And, and what goes with that is whether there should be any framework around um, reviews of cases. If there's been a murder and there's been an acquittal, should there be um, a requirement that every three years or five years or whenever it is, the case is looked at again? The Stephen Lawrence case uh, eventually um, led to convictions because it was reviewed on a number of occasions and on the um, last review, a tiny, tiny speck of blood was found by techniques not available at the time, as you probably know, that showed that Stephen Lawrence's blood um, was on Gary Dobson's jacket and that had gone on wet. Um, but it was only because the case was reviewed that that ever was seen and we were able to apply to quash the acquittal in the first place and then successfully prosecute um, Dobson uh, for that murder. So um, bridging in mandatory reporting, support and information, review of decisions, court process and after court um, support. So those are the issues we're looking at. What I would find invaluable in the rest of the time we've got available is any questions or comments on those issues because um, in a sense for us, 2015 is a big moment. It's the first time that we're likely to get legislation. I think if it's going to work, it's got to obviously be the best it can be. It's got to have the best consensus it can get. Um, although on this, I'm on the Labour Party task force, um, I think this should be a cross-party issue. I don't think victims' rights um, should be anything other than um, uh, established by consensus and something which will be enduring. Um, and therefore, we're very keen to have as wide a debate as possible. Uh, and I'm very keen to hear your views and take your questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.